I did put to Laura, I put the pre-emergence one picture in the chat to if we reference it. So right hi everyone and welcome to another week of chat with green aggies uh, this week we have some special topics uh, discussing biochar also whopper begonias the plant of the week and also some pre-emergent herbicides especially as some questions have come in uh, as they pertain to turf so first we're gonna have dr mung mung gu talk about biochar and go ahead take it away all right thank you all uh for your uh, interest this week. And I want to mention again, uh, it's Dr. Uh, Becky Bolin who made this wonderful banner uh, for a chat with uh, Green Aggies. We have some very talented people uh, in our group among our panelists. Becky is an artist and Erfang is our uh, tech specialist. And he just made a, uh, a one link one link for all, one link fits all uh, that for the future. Uh, uh, registrations for September and October. So uh, big applause for these two young uh, people in our group. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> all right, I will talk about a little bit about um, the research uh, effects of biochar uh, incorporation on plant growth and in container production. Um, I guess before um, I start talking about biochar, I want to let you know why we are doing this type of research. Um, currently in, uh, in horticulture production, currently in horticulture production, majority of the, uh, the, the component that we're using is peat. And you all know that, you know, we harvest peat from, uh, from uh, peat bogs in, in, you know, in uh, uh, Canada, in some of the, those northern uh, atmosphere uh, areas like uh, northern Europe, uh, there are some uh, peat production in Michigan, in uh, northeast China, you know, in those areas. Um, and often, you know, we harvest peat uh, and that use that as a major component in uh, container production, especially in greenhouse container pr production because of its just superior, uh, you know, uh, physical and chemical uh, characteristics. However, peat, uh, peat bogs uh, are often underestimated for their uh, huge uh, carbon sink, for their carbon sink capability. So in another term is that, they, you know, they're this huge um, uh, moderating force when it comes to, you know, moderating uh, carbon sink, carbon emissions and stuff. And harvesting peat and then restoring uh, peat land from peat harvesting, it, it just, you know, it, it's not the same. So, so there has been a lot of effort in doing, you know, searching for uh, peat alternatives, try to uh, replace some or all of peat in, uh, in greenhouse uh, substrate. For instance, coconut core is, is one uh, product, you know, using the, uh, using the, the coconut core uh, process coconut core to you know as a peat substrate and so our effort is using a biochar which is a solid product of pyrolysis and the really pyrolysis is a fancy word if any uh, biomass you know if you burn it when you burn it it just comes with ash you know it goes with co2 it produces heat but if you take oxygen away you know, if you take oxygen away from this burning process, well, what you got is you all get some uh, some solid uh, product, and that's biochar. You may get some uh, um, uh, gas, uh, biogas, or bio oil. So those are the you know solid, liquid, and gas products from uh, biochar, depending on the uh, the temperatures, the uh, pressure, the uh, other uh, other. Um, uh, conditions that you may do, you know, the the end product, the ratio of the biochar, bio oil, and biogas may vary uh, significantly. So, so we have been uh, we have been uh, conducting uh, using biochar as a uh, peat, uh, oh, using biochar as a peat substitute for uh, over ten years. And this is the uh, a list of peer-reviewed publications 
uh, that's coming out of uh, our, our, our research. And the one highlighted, you know, some of the data that I present, uh, some of the data that I present that uh, uh, are from these, uh, the list of uh, manuscripts that uh, um, just published a couple of years ago. And actually today, uh, one of my students, Ping, just got another uh, accepting uh, uh, email. Uh, she, she has another uh, uh, publication got accepted. So uh, we have been working a lot on, you know, just trying, looking at different aspects, uh, different aspects, different type of biochar uh, to replace uh, peat in container substrate. Uh, so this is uh, what you see here. Uh, that this is the the, the figure is the um, uh, list of uh, is a picture. When you look, I mean, using a really fancy microscope, to look deep, deep down. So that's what the uh, the surface of uh, some type of biochar. I say some type of biochar. This is uh, biochar. Is is you know a there's no the biochar is always a biochar or this biochar because uh, the feedstocks, what you make, what you use to make biochar uh, could vary significantly. That could be any type of biomass. Uh, and then the, uh, the condition could vary significantly, like the temperature, like how fast you uh, reach certain temperature, the pressure, and, and then, you know, uh, after the char is made, you know, the some may choose to have some uh, post uh, processing, uh, um, you know, some post processing. So all these things uh, coming together um, will change the biochar, will change the biochar uh, characteristics significantly. So, so, so what we have here are uh, some of the type of the biochar that we have worked with um, in terms of using as container substrate. <clears throat> I'll just give you an example. In container substrate, uh, we're looking, structure is definitely one thing that we're looking at. You know, the, just like soil particles, you, know, you gotta have some uh, structure, you gotta have some texture. Uh, so in containers, uh, drainage is very important and drainage is often achieved by have certain size of the particles because the certain size of particles uh, it helps to either uh, maintain airspace or uh, maintain the um, water maintain uh, the uh, mixed uh, moisture so uh, there was one time I visited a lab uh, that makes biochar and the biochar that the, the feedstock they have is uh, cow manure and if you think about it, you know, cow manure itself is a very fine, I mean, uh, without the, uh, you know, without the moisture, if you look at the cow manure, it's, it's a very, they're very fine um, uh, particles, you know, going through the four uh, component compartments of the cow uh, stomach and then the whole, uh, you know, digestive system. So, you know, it's the, the cow manure itself is, has very fine texture. And then you go through the, the burning, the pyrolysis process. So when I look at the biochar, the cow manure biochar, it's basically just like black uh, flour. Uh, it really lacks any significant, it doesn't have any chunks, doesn't have any good sized particles. So when you water that in, there's hardly any uh, ma uh, macro pores that helps with the airspace. So when I look at that, it was like, uh, well, this is definitely not suitable to be used in a uh, pot and mix. So, so uh, you know, you, you always look at some of the things, you know, you, you got an idea of their particle size, you know, this may work. And, and pinewood biochar is the first biochar that I ever worked with. Uh, when I look at the, you know, the size distribution, you know, you put those in, in your hand, it's like, oh, this may work. It kind of resembles, it kind of resembles the, uh, you know, uh, some of the uh, peat particle size distribution a little bit. So, you know, at least you got something similar to start with. <clears throat> so the, um, so the, the, the first pinewood biochar that we used, uh, you know, has a pretty good pH, 5.3. Uh, normally, uh, peat, the peat pH is in the 
uh, four, you know, four or even as low as three sometimes. So this is the particle size distribution. Um, so then we, you know, take a look at, uh, you look at their uh, container physical properties. So this is looking at the airspace, total porosity. This is a total porosity. Container capacity tells you uh, how much water it may contain, you know, after you water the thing and then all the excess water drain out, what's left over in that container is called, you know, what's the, the water left over in the container is called container capacity. Uh, the airspace are talking about the bigger pores um, and then bulk density. Bulk density is important in a certain way, uh, you know, if the biochar is not made on site, it got to be shipped to, uh, to, from the manufacturing to the uh, location of use and then you definitely have to think about the bulk density in terms of shipping and handling fees. So if you look at um, the biochar that we used, the pine wood biochar, you know, compared to Sunshine Mix number one, this is one of the uh, commercially available uh, peat-based, one of the commercially available peat-based substrate. And this peat moss itself or bark, Bark is often used in outdoor. Bark is often used in uh, outdoor uh, nursery, uh, nursery uh, production. As you can see that bark itself um, has uh, uh, the, you know, the total porosity, the container capacity, <coughs> the container capacity is, is lower. Um, So, um, so in one of the experiments, we mixed biochar with uh, just, you know, just looking at uh, different percentages. We mixed biochar with the sunshine mix, the, uh, the commercially available peat based, you know, this is a uh, hundred percent uh, peat based uh, poly mix and this is a hundred percent biochar and in between we mixed 20 percent, 40 percent, 60 percent, 80 percent, you know, by volume uh, because commercially, you know, in the big area, you know, they, what they do is, you know, one scoop of this, uh, five scoop of this, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's always by, uh, you know, by volume and, and, um, the uh, the academics, the and the industry, uh, the horticulture industry has been conducting this uh, you know substrate research for a long time, for over I don't know 40, 50 years, and this is a suitable range. You know this is what listed here is you know the suitable range as a container as container um, uh, you know as container mix like total porosity, container uh, capacity, airspace. Uh, bulk density and then bulk density at container capacity. So basically this is the dry uh, bulk density and this is the wet uh, bulk density. So this is the uh, suit, this is the suitable range. It's actually, you know, it's, it's actually a pretty a wide range as you can imagine. Uh, some plants may prefer, uh, you know, on the drier side, more, uh, more air. Some may prefer in the, uh, on the more uh, the, the wetter uh, side, and then again, you know, if <clears throat> if a certain um, a certain uh, pot of mix dry uh, dries out too fast, and you could always, you know, uh, you know, instead of watering it once per day, you could water it uh, uh, twice per day or three times per day. You know, you could change your slightly change your uh, production regime, you know, according to the um, uh, the pot and mix. So there are ways, uh, you know, to compensate either for, uh, uh, you know, holding water too long or not uh, holding as much water. There are ways to compensate for that. Um, so as you can see that, you know, the biochar percentage from zero to a hundred percent is still kind of, you know, within this, uh, within this, uh, this range. So, um, so we, uh, we did experiment, we actually it's, this is, this is really like, um, just like a kind of two experiments. One is that we replace a bark with biochar, you know, at 20% increment. 
uh, and then uh, another experiment is replacing uh, sunshine, sunshine, the uh, commercial peat based, commercial peat based um, potted mix, you know, with biochar, again, you know, from zero to 100% at the 20% uh, increment. <clears throat> So this is the uh, this is the this is the chart that this is the figure that we're looking at and and this uh, this red line it basically tells you uh, you know what where the uh, control is you know what we are comparing to so you know this is uh, this is a hundred percent pine bark and then you know as you go towards the right you know the uh, in the biochar percentage increases 20, 40, 60, 80, all the way to 100% biochar. And as you can see that in, you know, when we are growing, um, this is a uh, uh, black seed, uh, Simpson, Simpson lettuce. Uh, when we grow the Simpson lettuce in, in the biochar and pine bark mix, you know, the 20%, 40%, 60% actually, uh, you know, increased the fresh weight of, uh, of lettuce. Um, they all had a uh, slightly better. I don't remember the uh, the statistics. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. I don't remember the statistics on this. Um, oh. But this is, and this is what what we're looking at. You know, a hundred percent pine bark, and then with increase in uh, twenty percent biochar, forty percent biochar, sixty, eighty, a hundred. So remember the uh, the. The figure before, you know, 20, 40, and 60 were slightly better than the, uh, you know, the, the original that we're comparing to. <clears throat> and this is a, uh, a mugshot from a different angle, the mugshot from a different angle that the 20, 40, and 60% biochar, uh, you know, had a higher uh, fresh weight than the control, than the 100% by pine bark. Uh, so this on this side, on the left side, this is comparing, you know, to the pine bark. And remember in the previous uh, table that I showed that, you know, uh, one, uh, one side of the, um, the research we're doing, you know, replacing uh, pine bark. And then uh, the other half of the research were replacing the commercial substrate, the, um, the peat based, the commercial peat based. And this is what it looked like. You know, this is 100% in, uh, in, in uh, peat based. And this is what we replace in uh, 20, 40, 60%. Okay, so this is the figure showing that, you know, compare. This is the figure for, uh, for the right half. So this is a figure for the right half of the uh, of the res of the lettuce growing so compared to the 100% sunshine mix when we increase the biochar percentage in 20 40 60 all the way to 100 that it's actually all better you know had higher fresh weight than the commercial uh, peat based uh, potted mix and what we're seeing here is really uh, and i think is because it's it's increased it increased the uh, the airspace because peat peat generally they hold water well and then in this case in this case that you know that the uh, uh, biochar incorporation is helping to uh, uh, make that uh, you know make it having more air and that's probably why it has increased uh, the lettuce. <clears throat> Oh, this is the this is the uh, the sunshine. This is the peat base from uh, you know just a top angle. Uh, this is a, a different pic, a different plant. Uh, this is a chrysanthemum. Uh, this is a chrysanthemum in uh, uh, either pine bark or the uh, or the biochar. Uh, so we measured the growth uh, index four times. You know, uh, we measured it four times and looking at. So this is the uh, this is the total, and again, you know, you'll see that uh, uh, they're fairly similar, except this one. Except this one, this may be an outlier. You know, this sixty percent biochar may be an outlier, but still, uh, it looks you know even all the way to a hundred. It's about the same or better than a hundred percent biochar. This is what the chrysanthemum uh, looks like uh, in the picture. 
uh, somehow this this uh, sixty percent uh, there's something wrong with that uh, with that uh, that uh, treatment. Uh, so this was, <clears throat> you know, we often. We actually have uh, two more other plants, but you know I don't have a whole lot of time. So this is actually what we're looking at. You know, if you look at the roots, uh, so on the top, this is the uh, commercial um, peat-based potted mix, and if you look at the roots, they're uh, uh, even with you know twenty percent all the way to a uh, hundred percent biochar. The roots look very good. The roots look very good. And this is the pine bark. This is the pine bark uh, mixed with, uh, you know, twenty percent all the way to one hundred percent biochar. So you can see that. Remember that, you know, twenty percent, forty percent, and sixty percent. You know, the uh, the fresh weight of um, of lettuce was slightly higher than control. And if you look at the roots, they're very similar. And then uh, maybe because uh, pine bark has already got pretty high airspace, so add in more. You know, adding significantly amount more uh, airspace may not help in the case of vine bark. So that could be the case. That could be the case. Um, so, uh, so those were the short-term uh, plants that we tested. And then we're like, uh, what would happen if we test some uh, long-term uh, plants? So we tested the uh, poinsettia. We tested poinsettia and then Easter lily. Uh, I'm not going to go through these data and I just, you know, use the picture. So uh, in this case, in the poinsettia that we grow from uh, at the end of August to all the way to the end of uh, uh, November, this is what the, uh, you know, the 20%, 40%, 60%. So these two, when uh, re replacing the uh, peat-based uh, potting mix, 20% and 40% was actually uh, just about the same as the control. And the 60, 60, 80, 100, that's slightly a little too much for when it comes to uh, poinsettia. Now this is what it looked like. Uh, and we also did the rating. And then in terms of uh, uh, Easter lily, so Easter lily is another uh, long crop, you know, um, it's there normally comes in the, in a ball, you know, little as a little bulb and you pot them up in, in December and then you sell them right before Easter. So this is, this is definitely a long, long crop. I'm going to uh, skip some of these. Uh, uh, so this is what it looks like, uh, in Easter Lily. And, uh, we didn't go all the way to a hundred percent because a hundred percent in, uh, in uh, poinsettia, there are some uh, uh, root zone disease issues. So this one, we just went all the way to 80%. And, you know, if you're not looking at the percentage uh, at the bottom, it, they, I mean, they look just about the same to me. Um, what do you all think? Um, So that was uh, that was uh, a pinewood biochar, and later on we had uh, a, a chance to work with a mixed hardwood biochar. And as you can see, that uh, this hardwood biochar has a much higher has much higher a pH. And you know, if you have done a, a container production, you know that this uh, pH is very important in uh, in container production. The previous softwood uh, the pinewood biochar that we had was, you know, was the pH was about five versus this one is 10.5. It's very high. It's too high. Uh, often in the container production, we're shooting at, uh, for most of the crops, we're shooting at 5.5 to 6.5. So this is way high. In addition, in addition that the EC 1.1, you know, uh, that's without adding any fertilizer, there's already the high EC there. So when we, one of the reason that I was gonna, I was willing to give it a try was because, uh, again, I was looking at the, uh, the physical property, you know, looking at the size uh, distribution and I was look at that, okay, uh, you know, this is the, this is a size distribution. This is the, this is the size, the, the biggest chunk is where, you know, they will give you the, 
the big airspace. Well, this type of biochar, it gives too much of that. Uh, it gives too much of that uh, airspace. So I need something to bring it down. You know, I need something to bring it down. So one of the things that I thought was uh, vermicompost uh, was, you know, vermicompost is, is, is the, the end product after worms, uh, you know, uh, process some of the, the garbage, some of the, um, um, the biomass, and what you get is, you know, the, the coming through the digestive system of the worms. It has just like cow manure, they have very fine texture. So like, oh, maybe I could use vermicompost uh, to mix with uh, biochar. Uh, so that uh, we could achieve a certain level, you know, similar level of uh, the, the airspace as a commercial substrate. So we did a, uh, we did a huge, we did a, a, a huge uh, 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 experiment. We had a huge trial uh, in that, um, in that we, uh, you know, the biochar, we go from uh, zero to 20, 40, 60, 80. And then we uh, mixed with, uh, uh, you know, from zero or five, uh, 10, 15 to 20% of uh, uh, worm casting, that's a vermicompost. And for whatever the, the refs, you know, the rest, we, uh, we had 20%, uh, uh, you know, we used the commercial substrate to make up the uh, difference. And because the pH was so high, uh, we're thinking, huh, maybe we should use sulfur. Maybe we should use sulfur to bring down the, um, use sulfur to bring down the pH. Uh, we don't know whether that's gonna work, but this is the only tool. Well, this is one of the easiest tool. Another tool would be uh, insect, uh, would be uh, uh, acid injection. And that's actually, uh, that's easier done if you have certain equipment. Uh, but in our case, uh, we're like, well, let's just, uh, you know, uh, mix sulfur uh, in this, hoping that sulfur during the, during the experiment time, that sulfur may be able to, uh, you know, digest it by the uh, microbes and change to uh, sulfuric acid, and that will bring down the pH. That was our hope. And then we had a fertigation, you know, uh, 0%, uh, 0 ppm, 75, 150, 225, and 300. And depending on crops, uh, depending on crops, uh, some heavy feeders like uh, moms and poinsettias, uh, they're often uh, fed at uh, 300 ppm often, you know. And then there are some uh, low feeding uh, crops that, you know, they're they're fed at maybe 100 to 150. So it really depends on different crops. Uh, some crops uh, prefer uh, heavy feeding and some uh, prefer light feeding. So this is, this is what we got. This is, uh, this is uh, what we got. Uh, this is what we got. This is one of the, the plants that uh, we're looking at. And you can see that this is like all over the place. This is all over the place. Uh, and I'm gonna come back to this one. So, you know, so uh, tw uh, 25, 25 treatments, 25 treatments, 25 treatments from, uh, uh, you know, one to five, six to 10. Uh, so basically every five treatments, uh, you know, the, the, num the uh, percentage of biochar change. And then within the five, what changes, you know, is the, uh, is the uh, worm casting. And then, uh, and then you know, all these uh, fertigations were re were were randomized. So, uh, so, so what you can see here is hopefully, hopefully, you know, you know. So we're looking at one to five. Oh, uh, with this, it's going up. So these five, and then with this, you know, it there's a certain level going up. But I'll tell you this: uh, after we done this, after we done this. Um, because the uh, fertigation, because the fertigation was, uh, was uh, um, they're all randomized. So, you know, uh, uh, they're all randomized. So, you know, at this one, it may have uh, like a 0% of worm casting, you have 300%. 
and then you know you so so basically it's 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 a mess after we look at the data we're like okay this is this is kind of a mess um maybe we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't be doing uh, a large trial you know with all these variables you know the variables of biochar percentage the variables of um, uh, vermicompost percentage uh, and also the variables of uh, fertigation so like ah oh, this is uh, this is totally this is totally a mess again this may help you to uh, to look at it better uh, you know 20 uh, zero biochar zero percent biochar all the way to 80 percent and within each within each uh, segment you know the uh, vermicompost goes from zero to uh, 20 percent but then you know but then the the, the fertigation, uh, the amount of nitrogen that we put in these five are totally whack. So it really has a lot more to do with the uh, the amount of. Um, it definitely has a lot more to do with the uh, uh, the amount of nitrogen, the fertilization that we put in these in these uh, um, treatments. So we're not gonna do uh, we're not gonna do that kind of uh, big treatment anymore. We're just doing the smaller uh, you know uh, trials with smaller uh, number of, uh, of of treatments of variables. <coughs> so here's one. Um, so we're looking at vermicompost. I say smaller uh, from 25 to 17. We're uh, eight treatments less. So in this we have. Uh, Again, we're using 5, 10, 15, 20% of vermicompost. And then within that, you know, within each vermicompost, we have either 20%, 40%, 60%, or 80% of biochar. And then whatever, you know, we use the, uh, the commercial uh, substrate to, uh, to make up the rest to reach to 100%. And then remember this 100% is by volume. So this is by volume. So in this case, you know, 20% plus 80, 20% vermicompost plus 80% vermicompost, there's, you know, zero left for, for commercial com, uh, for commercial substrate. So we're making all these uh, mixes and comparing it to, you know, what's on the market, what the commercial substrate on the, uh, on the market. And again, remember this one is still uh, pH uh, 10.5. Well, I forgot to mention that in the previous one, in the previous one, uh, in this one with the big mess, um, we now call it a big mess. What, re what we really found was that uh, well, sulfur was really not making a huge deal. It was really not a huge deal in this. So, so in this one, we just let go uh, sulfur. Phew, uh, this is, uh, again, this is this treatment. Because we have so many treatments, I'm going to use this uh, to just a, as a reminder that we have, you know, these are the treatments we have. So each of this is this. And then we measure the thing, we measure the, the pH, we measure the pH, you know, zero weeks, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and nine weeks after the experiment started. I'm going to go so the control is definitely, you know, the control is, uh, you know, the pH is within the, uh, within the, uh, you know, six, the 5.5 to 6.5 is within range. But then everything else, all the, the ones with the biochar are, are higher. But let's look at basal. Let's look at basal. Remember, this is control and all the others had a biochar or a vermicompost. So they're either about the same or better than control in this case. And then all the other measurements like shoot dry weight, and root dry weight, and total dry weight. And remember this one, this red line, you know, this is where the control is. This is where the commercial uh, pot and mix is. Commercial pot and mix, commercial pot and mix. So whatever that we were measuring, the growth of basil, that uh, they're, you know, the ones with the, uh, biochar and uh, vermicompost was better than the, um, than the, uh, the um, uh, commercial substrate. And I want to remind you here, remind you here is that, uh, you know, this is, uh, we did have some uh, treatments, you know, not like the last treatment, like the last one within these four treatment cluster, you know, this one had a zero peat in it, you know, peat-based uh, polymix. This one had 5% uh, 
of peat-based substrate, 10% peat-based substrate, and 15% peat-based substrate. Now look at this. So this is the zero peat, 5% peat-based, 10% peat-based, and 15% peat-based. So I would say we've done a pretty good job uh, looking at the basal, uh, looking at the basal. This is the basal growth index. And then let's look at the tomatoes. Uh, well, again, you know, this is the, uh, this is the uh, zero peat-based, 5% peat-based, 10% peat-based, and 15% peat-based. And this is the 100% peat-based commercial uh, potting mix. And what do you all think? And similarly, when we look at the leaf dry weight, stem dry weight, the root dry weight, the root dry weight, uh, there is a story there. Uh, this is a flower and fruits dry weight. So again, you know, if we're comparing this, um, so all of these, you know, the leaf dry weight, stem dry weight, the flower and fruit dry weight. So the above uh, ground part uh, that, you know, the, uh, all these biochar mixes are doing pretty well. Uh, these two may not be as good, just, just these two, uh, the above ground part. I don't know why that the root dry weight was all, you know, smaller than this control, but the above ground is doing great. Uh, so again, this is the, this is, so adding all those together, adding all the above ground, the below ground all together. So this is what, what it looks like for, uh, for a tomato. So all of them, these are uh, higher or similar dry weight compared to this control. Um, I'm gonna stop here uh, as the, the time, I'm taking too much time. Uh, our next step uh, we had, because vermicompost, vermicompost is generally slightly uh, more expensive, slightly more expensive. So, uh, so like, huh, can we use, uh, can we use some uh, cheap stuff like chicken manure uh, instead of <laughs> instead of using the uh, the manure from worms? Can we just use chicken manure uh, in in this experiment? So we had some very interesting uh, 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 results from this. I may have to share with you uh, next time. Um, but still, you know, uh, we really have seen some very uh, promising uh, results uh, from you know, from using biochar. And, you know, if it's not uh, vermicompost, it could be some other things that we, we may be able to mix, you know, to, to help uh, the plants grow in containers. And, and just looking at a lot of the research that we have done, and I really have hope that we may be able to substitute, you know, a portion or even all, you know, 100% of, of peat to be used in the uh, in, in container production and hopefully we could contribute our little, make our little contribution to slow down the peat harvest, you know, slow down the peat harvest and, uh, and whatever uh, consequence that it may bring to the global uh, climate change. With that, I will turn it to back to Erfan. Thank you, Dr. Gu. Are there any questions that uh, any of the participants would like to ask at this point? I'll ask a question, Dr. Gu, on behalf of all participants everywhere. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about the cost of vermicompost and um, the lower cost of composted chicken manure, but what's, when you look at all the components that you worked with, what was the least expensive one? What was the most expensive one? And I understand the, the importance of the ecological impact of using less peat, but how do you weigh out all the other factors against this cost. Uh, you're muted. Ah, uh, you're muted. Oh, there you go. Laura, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Remember, uh, when I did this uh, presentation at IPPS, uh, you know, the grower, of course, uh, that's one of their concerns, you know, is about the, is about the, uh, the, 
the economics. Um, and we, we have to understand in a way that, uh, you know, the peat industry has been, the peat industry has been, uh, you know, it has been perfected over uh, how many, you know, tens of uh, years, 40, 50 years, or even longer versus the uh, biochar industry. This is really still at this uh, baby stage. So, so really, uh, the scale, I think the main issue, the main, I think the main issue of the, the economics here is the scale. If uh, biochar is uh, produced and utilized in the scale as big as the peat these days, I think the uh, economics may not be that much an issue when used uh, biochar in production. Uh, did I did I answer your question? Sort of. Sort of. So yeah. at this so at so at this stage, I would say the price of uh, biochar uh, is still, um, still more expensive than 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 the. Uh, but the thing is, there are uh, there are uh, some outrageously there are some outrageously uh, expensive biochar on the internet, mm -hmm. and my uh, my. My two cents on that is that uh, if your biochar is more expensive than the tomatoes that you buy, <laughs> then it's prob then it's then it's probably not worth it because because five one pound of biochar incorporated in your soil, it's probably not gonna give you uh, you know the one pound of uh, a tomato that you know the benefit and so uh, so. Uh, so, so, and, and that's my, you know, just, uh, just a uh, rough uh, math when I when I look at those prices. There are some outrageous uh, price prices of biochar on the internet. So that's really uh, that's uh, that's something I would uh, I would uh, recommend against. Um, but yeah, but but you know, type in your uh, type type your question in the in the chat, and and it's really lovely to see all you guys uh, typing where you're from and stuff like that, you know, in the, uh, in the chat, it's, it's great to know. Thank you. Thank you guys for a chime in. So I think, uh, I think we had, do we have one more question? I thought I saw someone put their hand up. Yeah. Isaac. Yeah. Yeah. I had a question. You mentioned, I got a little late to the meeting, Miss Gu. You said uh, the biochar is made of what kind of product? Is that wood or garbage used or what type of product is a waste made manufactured from? I was like, are you still in China? Yeah, you. in Guangzhou. <laughs> oh, I stayed up tonight, finally, because I was, I drank a bunch of puar. But Wow. Um, the, uh, uh, I may have missed uh, the introduction part, uh, Isaac. Yeah. The, um, uh, so any biomass, any biomass and you know so like wood prod you know like wood waste mm -hmm. like a sewage waste let's say uh yes. like straw like agriculture agriculture byproduct anything you know any any crops that you harvest that you mm -hmm. don't need all the leftover and those those are you know biomass those could be used as feedstocks so okay. oftentimes the uh the the price you know oftentimes the the cost is not mm. is not so much in the making is not in the pyrolysis process yeah. making biochar is in the process that you know collecting you know collecting yeah. these uh collecting these biomass what would be the most economical way to collect these like for instance um for instance, in uh, in South Texas, uh, there's this giant reed grass, which is invasive, is taking up the waterway, you know, uh, smothering native flora. You know, that would be that would be uh, great, uh, you know, to use as feedstock for uh, for you know to make biochar for other uses. But then it's really so. I talk. I I had a discussion with uh, with some folks in the in ecosystems and and their uh, their question is that um, you know it's it's how do we ha how do you harvest and transport these uh, these giant reed grass you know just just these things 
So it's not like, again, going back to the, um, going back to the, the peat bogs, yeah. you know, the, the whole process is down, is down to, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an art and that uh, it's been perfected over 40, 50 years. And, uh, you know, it's all that one location and then, you know, uh, well, you know, generally um, speaking, that yeah, you know, England. the peat, peat, peat bogs where they are, you know, in Canada, mm -hmm. in Michigan, in uh, in northern Europe, in you know, in those areas. So you know, you just harvest from those peat dog, peat bogs, and then you have some uh, uh, some semi um, um, uh, semi finished product, and then you ship those things to the to some mixed plants, either you know in in Texas or in the air, other areas, you make the final product, and then you know from those those uh, uh, plants, you ship the final products to the uh, greenhouse growers. So there's a uh, so there's again, Logistic. like I said, this is still the distribution. Yes, you know the the distribution network is also you know there's no distribution network of biochar uh, currently, and also the collecting of uh, raw materials. And I would say, if I have to make a prediction, I would say like, you know, in like East Texas, in some of these uh, wooded area that where forest, you know, where forest, pro uh, forest industry is, is big thing, you know, utilizing their, um, utilizing their, uh, their, their waste products, you know, that would be, that would be one of my, uh, um, that, yeah, that would probably be, uh, you know, more economic in in doing some places you know completely um out of nowhere you know and also you got to be close to your distribution uh centers your your you know where your customers are because of the the bulk density right in the interest of time why yep. don't we go on over to paul winsky to talk about whopper begonias i'm hungry already yeah <laughs> talk about whoppers okay uh thank you Irfan. uh yeah we could have done some uh co-branding here uh with this talk today if uh with burger king but uh anyway texas superstar whopper begonias uh this is an interspecific hybrid uh if you are looking for a gaudy plant uh well, a almost a voluptuous type plant this is it uh it is texas sized uh, it's got, it's a large plant, it's got large foliage, and it's got large flowers. So the flowers don't get lost in that plant. Um, I'm in Houston. So for me, this plant performs much better in shade to partial shade, uh, maybe morning sun. Uh, that is about it. Now I've seen it further north uh, up in Chicago and this can grow in full sun and performs extremely well so it really just depends on where you are but between our heat our humidity uh, our growing conditions in the summer uh, I think uh, afternoon shade is, is, is definitely going to benefit this plant because uh, it, it's going to be difficult to keep this one uh, you know that that thirst factor uh, keeping it well watered uh, and as I said, it's large, so this is going to get easily uh, 24 to 30 inches. Um, ideal for mass plantings, mixed borders, or containers. So this container plant, this is actually one of the samples that we got as uh, the agents get as these Texas superstars are coming through. Um, it, I've got one on either side, and this thing just was nonstop. Now this is facing south, but it is uh, shaded because um, we've got an oak tree and several elms so um, but this thing just thrived throughout the entire growing season it overwintered since it was close to the house I just went ahead and I I cut it back in like March it flushed again and and they're still growing and blooming like crazy so um, I really love this plant as a container plant um, if you're a producer um, you know, you, you can grow this as a quart, uh, a gallon, and then anything larger, 10 to 12 inch baskets or, or what have you. If you're growing it as a quart, you're probably growing it more for the landscapers, uh, for the reholesalers. It's probably not going to have a lot of color on it, but they're buying it knowing how to use it. Um, uh, I probably wouldn't 
produce it as a cork for for retail um, because you, you really to get that full effect I would say something larger the 10 to 12 um, whatever tubs w whatever to get that wow effect because uh, this plant definitely has it uh, it is available in bronze and green leaf and the, the flower colors are red and rose so you can get bronze red and, or rose and you can get green leaf uh, red or rose uh, the other thing I've noticed um, with this plant is, uh, and with most of the begonias, um, the, the, the bronze foliage, uh, the more full sun you can get it, the better that foliage is going to look. It's going to look more bronzy. Um, if, it's, if it's in the shade more, you can see, you know, hints of it. Uh, it's more like highlights, but it's, it's not as dramatic. So you don't get that nice contrast of the flower uh, against the foliage. Um, but this is one plant that I've, I've really been uh, happy with. Um, you know, people driving by will stop if we're out, you know, uh, doing something and ask about the plant. So it's got that wow factor when it's in bloom and just the overall size of it. So, uh, and there's, there's a lot of other larger, large begonias out there now. Um, but Whopper was probably the first ones, uh, you know, to the market and uh, it performs extremely well for us down here. So, um, you know, uh, enjoy it. And if you can find it, grow it and uh, let me, let us know what you think about it. Thank you so much, Paul. I think I have those, uh, those begonias in our like shaded front patio area and where other things wouldn't really grow that well. And it, and they just like, they exploded. I love yeah. them. Yeah. They work really well. All right, so for our next one, we are gonna talk a little bit about some pre-emergent herbicides, especially as they pertain to turf. And so we have, oop, let me swap displays here. We have Laura Miller, who's gonna talk about that. You see hey, that Paul, screen okay? do you know uh, uh, where you can get those Whopper uh, begonias? Uh, like, let's say, you know, in DFW or in, in Houston area, who are, you know, what are some of the wholesalers who are uh, growing those? Good question. I do not know, but I think if you go to the Texas Superstar website, it will have a list of retailers that carry them. And also, I think it lists growers that may be producing them also. Uh, so I, I, I would take a look there. Yeah, and that's a good point. Um, those are pretty easy to find, though. I, I think I've seen a lot more of them out on the out on the market. I mean, adoption was pretty good. And Paul, I just sent you a picture um, from the Fort Worth Botanic Garden the other day. So they look pretty great there right now. All right, so Airfon sent out a thing this morning, said, anybody got anything else to talk about? And I thought, well, what have people been asking me this week? They've been asking me about reemergent herbicides. Because this is our North Texas, uh, oh, that's beautiful. I don't know, we're seeing your, okay. Our North Texas window for application is open for those in turf. Um, you know, you just have a few weeks, late summer, very early fall to get out there and get ahead of those um, winter uh, grasses in turf. And um, the question that I got was, I, I want to, put out a pre-emergent on a sports field and then overseed. And the, this chart is really great for that because you're wanting to uh, look at how long do you have to wait after application before you could overseed. So there's, a, there's an overseeding interval on, on most of the labels. And if you look at that, um, you can get an idea of, you know, what you might be able to do. So if you put out your your pre-emergent today, you could overseed, you know, at the end of October or so, which, which might work out pretty well. I um, also wanted to point out that when you're looking at pre-emergents, that, that number over on the side, that's the mode of action number. A lot of them are those threes. Uh, that's all those um, kind of what we call seedling uh, root inhibitors sometimes. They all kind of work the same way. And obviously, you know, if you're, if you're regularly using pre-emergent herbicides, you do want to try to rotate that mode of action. But when you look down there at 29, you can see that's, that's the indazoflam, which has a completely different um, mode of action. It's a cellulose inhibitor, so it just can't form that plant uh, cell wall, which is 
you know, part of being a plant cell, you've got to have a cell wall. So it lasts for a really long time to, um, has a long, long uh, interval before you could overseed, which indicates that it just works for a long time. And I do know that that's often used, sometimes in combination with glyphosate, in areas where you just don't want anything to grow for a long time. You don't want anything to, to, to seed out and grow, like in the non-crop areas and nurseries, and also in nurseries in those long-term crops. Uh, not the spectacle flow, but that other forms of endazoflam are, are pretty widely used in that in that sort of setting. So, Dr. Becky Balling, you got anything you want to say about this? Because this is this is a hot topic these days. Yeah, I mean, I think what you have here is great for professionals. I would caution some of our master gardeners yes. that many of the products that are listed here are not going to be suitable for home lawn use. In fact, some of them are not even labeled for that type of use at all. And a lot of these fall into a category of uh, what I would call professional grade products, which means they may not technically have label restrictions preventing you from buying them, but I would still discourage unless you're very familiar with the process of calibration and doing these calculations and everything else, even some of these products I would discourage. But we do have a, a guide that is more homeowner friendly that has uh, many of these same active ingredients listed that's available for download on the Aggie Turf website. So if you are a homeowner or a master gardener and you're interested in more information on this, there it is right there. Um, answers a little, a uh, few FAQs that we get about pre-emergence herbicides, what they are, how they work, um, and it also has a list of some of the primary active ingredients that we see in box store products or those products that are more widely available for homeowner use. Um, the list of sites of action or modes of action is even shorter than the one Laura presented when you're talking about these box store products. And, and many of these are going to be, as she indicated, um, they're, they're mitotic inhibitors. They, they inhibit cell division and they can have an impact on your grass if you over apply them or if you're not cautious. So just making sure we always read and follow the label um, very carefully. Um, I also wanted to mention briefly that Corteva actually has a fairly new product out. It's two older actives, but they're being combined now into one product um, for our professionals called Crew. And it's a combination of Dithiapir and Isoxaben. And Isoxaben, which is Gallery, that's the, the trade name for that product, um, is particularly effective with some of our broadleaf annual weeds. So as Laura indicated, grassy winter annuals are very challenging, certainly in turf. We've got poa annua, we've got rescue grass, we have several um, that can be very problematic. But we also have several uh, winter annual broadleaf weeds that can also be very challenging. Uh, burr clover is one example of one that a lot of people don't like to have in their yard. And so um, if, if you are professional managing landscapes and you've noticed that you also have some, some broadleaf annuals sneaking in, you may look at a product that, that has gallery in it or look at combining um, isoxaben with a product uh, that, that has more uh, grassy weed coverage. Um, and as you can see here on this table, even endazoflam is in one box store product. It's not in a lot and it's in it in a pretty low rate, but it is in this bio-advanced three-in-one weed and feed for southern lawns. This is where I do my little asterisk where I say I'm not a huge weed and feed fan. Um, because I think sometimes it leads to the application of fertilizers at an inappropriate time. Um, but if you are looking to uh, try that active ingredient, um, that is a product that you, you can purchase. So those, those are my comments. <laughs> yeah, cool. Doc, Dr. Becky, we're not getting any sponsorship from uh, Corteva, are we? We're not. Uh, I mean, sh should we be seeking out and ask, uh, ask uh, you know, Mrs. Corteva to talk to Mr. Corteva? <laughs> yes, I should say that I'm not necessarily saying you should pick any one product over another, but I, I just feel it's good to introduce people to that product because it's fairly new and it's a pre-mix, which if you don't have to tank mix your own things, sometimes it's a plus. So, um, but certainly many companies besides Corteva <laughs> Number of great products. <laughs> okay, can we can we go back to uh, Laura's slide and yeah. and, and just so y'all know, I will be applying crew this weekend. Um, that's on my to do list because we have a bit at the farm lawn. We've got which we do not overseed, 
we have a bit of a challenge with burr clover sometimes. So that's that's one reason we'll, we'll go go at it with that. But anyway, okay. Yeah, yeah. What did you want to say, Mung Mung? Well, when I look at these things, you know, and I know that you listed maybe over ten of these things, and in my mind, they all look the same. It says herbicide. So, uh, so, so what, I mean, so within these, what are the, the cool season that, you know, the, that the, uh, you know, the long hair specials, you know, the specialists that, that they are, you know, they need to think about or look at, you know. So all of these are, are so I was, I would assume some of these are for warm season. Some of these are for cool season, right? Mm -hmm. All of these have efficacy on a pretty wide range of weeds. Yeah. Now, certainly we have studies that for specific weeds, we may have herbicides with, with some improved efficacy. So like, for example, with Poa annua, we do have studies that indicate that Barricade and Ronstar may be very effective options, whereas Metulachlor or Pennant Magnum may not be as effective with that weed. Um, but I think that's more weed specific and less seasonally specific yeah. in the case of a lot of our pre So these would all pretty much be warm or cool season grassy weeds in turf. Yeah. To sum it up. I also got a, a call this week from uh, uh, one of my committee members who works at site one and she said that they had had just a whole lot of homeowners coming in this year um, probably working at home more. Um, and, 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 and I would like to point out that Dr. Bowling's advice is very, very good. If you're not comfortable, you know, mixing, measuring, adding surfactants, don't, you know, you don't, you don't have to try to do that. Um, you, can, you can use your, your homeowner products or you can hire someone to do it. That They'll be happy to do it for you. So. We've got a couple questions. Yeah. Uh, one is, do you have similar charts for pre-emergent herbicides for container plant production of woody plants? Well, there are some. Uh, I don't have it handy. <laughs> Becky, do you, do you have one published? I don't have one published. A lot of my stuff has been very turf focused thus yeah. far. I'm sure I would like to recommend my, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Chris Marble at the University of Florida at the Apopka Center. He's got some stuff that's pretty current on uh, uh, container production pre emergence. So I All didn't right. I didn't pull it out for today, but, but uh, if you just yeah, Google Chris Marble UF, you'll probably find it. Got another question. What can I use on burr clover? Yeah, so again, I would say incorporating isoxabin or gallery into your pre emergence program. A lot of times it's recommended that you combine that product still with another product because it's not as it's not as effective on grassy weeds, but you can combine it with dimension or prodiamine, which is, uh, which is going to be barricade. So you can combine it with one of those, or as I indicated, purchase it in that, that crude product where it's already combined already. But that, that particular active is going to be typically the best option for some of these more challenging broadleaf weeds, um, as to form a barrier there. So that would be, that would probably be my recommendation. And then certainly Spectacle has a very broad range. I mean, Dazzleclam has a very broad range of weeds that it covers and it, it's got a, a decent amount of broadleaf weeds on it as well. But again, that's gonna be more of a professional grade product in particular for that one. It's also gonna be a little bit more expensive because it has such a long period of residual activity. Um, it's kind of a, an LED light bulb of pre-emergent herbicides. You're paying a little more for a little bit more uh, activity, but that, no, that if you are reseeding, like the person that contacted me this week, you do not want to use that. <laughs> right. And I'm just going to take a moment to get on a little stage and say, if you're a master gardener or a homeowner watching this and you are thinking about overseeding, please talk to a county agent or specialist in advance to make sure that it is the right fit. You know, our professional turf managers will do a lot of overseeding as part of their practices. And a lot of times it's appropriate for their purposes. But there are a lot of instances for home lawns where we would not recommend that practice. We even have some cities around here that have municipal ordinances that, that say that you cannot do it. So just make sure that if you are thinking about that, you talk to somebody first. Their ordinance say that you cannot uh, oversee? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? Yeah, because of water use. And, and we have some turf species that are not as tolerant of that practice. Um, you know, pr professionals doing it just have a better understanding of kind of 
what, what that should look like, how to make the transition in the spring. Um, you know, so it, it's just kind of different and, um, we don't always recommend it for, for a home lawn scenario. I wanted to say something, if I may, you mentioned the, the crew, um, herbicide, uh, granular pre-emergent herbicide, the same, uh, the same combination, uh, uh, for uh, container use in, in commercial production is called Fortress um, uh, and is, is marketed by OHP. Uh, it's, it's the same combination of saxobin and methylpyr. Uh, and uh, we're, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> great host. <laughs> great host, great uh, panel uh, service. <laughs> We've had a lot of success with, uh, with uh, susceptible plant material that you cannot use any other herbicides. And, and so this combination is, has been good on, on weeds, but soft on, on, on the crops. Uh, so if you're looking for crew in the, in the commercial side, it's called Fortress. Well, thank you, Carlos. <laughs> so yeah. Marcon, I'm, I'm gonna address that last question to you real quick. Oh, excellent, yes, please do. So the question is, um, do the applications of these herbicides require an applicator license issued by the state? So with a lot of these herbicides, the answer to that, it's very product dependent. We have a surprising amount of herbicides that, that are not restricted use products that you do not have to have a license to use. Um, with the list that Laura has up here, I can tell you some of these products we can only use in sod production or we can only use in certain turf systems and lawns may not be included in that. But again, you know, I would just say if you are a homeowner and, or a master gardener or something like that and you don't have a license and you don't have familiarity with, with how to apply these types of products, you know, Laura indicated uh, surfactants. Surfactants are commonly recommended with professional grade products. Many of us as homeowners may not have have those laying around or know how to incorporate them at all into a program. So, um, you know, I would just say in general, um, maybe focus more on some of the other products. Um, and then if you have specific questions around use, you know, with turf herbicides, we get a lot of little label stipulations that are like, you can use it on this species, but not this cultivar. You can use it on this species, but not in this particular scenario, but you can use it in this scenario. So if you ever have questions, I would just contact uh, a specialist or an agent to help you kind of sort through the label before you use the project, the product. I also appreciate Robbie saying, always read and follow your label instructions, which we should always say every single time we talk about anything. Yeah. There's no substitute. You can talk to, you can talk to, you know, uh, someone who's knowledgeable and that's great, but you still need to take the time to read and follow your label instructions. Yeah. Always. Carlos, there's a question for you. Is Fortress effective against spurges? It's, <clears throat> it's, so, it's somewhat uh, effective, not, not against all of them, but, but uh, um, uh, again, the, uh, the idea, there you go. <laughs> He's answering my questions. <laughs> I'm just researching at the same time. But yes, please, please continue, Carlos. So yeah, you, you see on the label listed uh, those, those spurges that we have, we have data on. Uh, so yeah, the answer is yes. Not all of them, uh, uh, but 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 the ones listed. Well, in, in general, isoxabin, isoxabin, I think you know is pretty good on a lot of small seeded broadleaf weeds. So you know anything that produces a lot of small seeds, isoxabin works pretty well. well one one thing that 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 is important with pre-emergent herbicides, uh, uh, if I may, is uh, is how you apply them, uniformity of application. Uh, and uh, and uh, and then the watering in uh, uh, as label re requires is very important for for uniform um, activity. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, maybe we'll give another few seconds here. If you have any other questions, put it in the chat or uh, feel free to uh, speak up. They have to uh, raise their hand to uh, speak up, right? Yeah, so well, I wanted to just say, because Robbie made another good point that I'm just now seeing about watersheds. So we do have several places here in Texas that are recharge zones for our underground or groundwater resources. And, and a lot of these products too will be very specific about 
what kinds of soil we can use them in and what kinds of environmental scenarios we can use them in safely. You know, these products are designed to be active in the soil. That's how they work. And so in some cases, they may not be uh, well suited for a certain environmental um, condition. And so again, read, reading the label, very important. And I always like to get a second opinion. You know, don't feel like you need to go at it alone. That's what AgriLife is here for, is, is as a secondary resource to help you find something that works for you. So. We got maybe time for this one last question. What do you recommend for lawn burr and when apply in DFW area? So lawn burr can refer to many different things. That can refer to lawn burr weed, it can refer to burr clover, and it can refer to sand burr, depending on who you're asking. And each of those weeds is going to be treated a little bit differently. And so, um, you know, we just did a presentation two weeks ago where I talked a little bit about sand burr and burr clover, which are more common. Okay, lawn burr weed is going to be another winter broadleaf annual um, that produces burrs similar to burr clover. And so, again, that's going to be a, a scenario in which I may look at uh, incorporating gallery or isoxibin in a winter pre-emergence herbicide application. We haven't really talked a lot about uh, specific temperatures and timing today. Um, in general, for winter applications or fall applications, I should say, we recommend that those be made when soil temperatures for the upper inch or so of soil reach around 70 degrees Fahrenheit for four to five consecutive days. Um, for North Texas, this often falls sometime between mid and late September, although it can vary some from year to year. Last year, we had like the hottest, driest September on record, and we were able to push that date a little bit. But um, in general, I just recommend some, some active monitoring. And a lot of times, your county agents will stay very, very alert to this. And so, and they may post things on your local, on their local stuff. I don't, Laura, I don't know if you do something like that. A lot of yeah, it just kind of depends, but um, some will include it in a newsletter or something like that. But I would just say, typically, I would say like the third week of September is a good time for DFW to think about an initial fall pre-emergence application. Laura, what are your thoughts from Tarrant County? I think that's, that's good. And of course, I mean, as you said, it does depend upon the weather. So, yeah. You know, but yeah. Great. Well, thank you all so much for preparing those topics. Thank you all who have joined us this week for another session of Chat with Green Aggies. Again, we have our chats every Thursday at 1212. We now have a single unified link to register for the next I think, couple months worth of Chat with Green Aggies. So get on there. You can register for all of them at once and uh, join us in uh, the future. So thank you all and have a nice day. Thank you, Airfall, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to send out a, um, I'll send out a link to uh, y'all for uh, coordinating for the next, um, for the next few weeks. How's that sound, Mung Mung? Yeah, yes, yes, All yes, right. yes. Becky, can you send me a